I have the opportunity and privilege to introduce Andreas Wiesman here today, who will be presenting. Uh, Andreas uh, is an assistant professor in the, of aviation here at USU. He spent uh, 27 years in the Air Force, and he loves airplanes. <laughs> and I will give the floor to Andreas. Thank you. So here's your moment of truth. You're sitting on the runway. You spent weeks preparing for today's mission. You've gone over and over all your planning. You've prepared your pre-flight. You inspected the airplane. You've done everything you need to do, and now it's time to advance the throttles. And when you're getting ready to take off, you're in a deployed location. You're, you're out there all isolated. And as a C-130 pilot, many times you think you can prepare for every contingency. You can prepare for every possibility, and yet the moment of truth arrives, and it's something different. Something always changes. How many of you felt like that on the first day of school? The first day of class, right? Okay. Um, you know, as I, as I think about life, I think about airplanes, and I think about the opportunity to fly, you spend all this time preparing and expecting everything to go well. You prepare for the perfect flight, the perfect weather, the payload, the crews all getting along together. Everything is ready, and it never fails that every day something is different. But for me, as a pilot in the Air Force, and I got to fly around the world, this was the view from my office. <laughs> this is what I got to see every day. Whether it's in the desert deployed, you can see the mountains with snow on the background. This is it. So there we are going down the runway. I'm sitting in the left seat, my co-pilot in the right seat, and right about the time we're ready to take off, I hear from the flight engineer, reject. He doesn't tell me why, he just says, reject the takeoff. So I smoothly pull the throttles to idle. Now, if he had said, reject takeoff, I would have probably reacted a little bit different. But he was very calm, and then I pulled the throttles back, and we stopped, and I said, what's going on? He says, we've got an overheat light, 3,000 degree temperature air is blowing out in the wing where the fuel is, we need to stop. So I just wanted to tell you that sometimes that's the way it feels like when you're going through life, right? And if I can get back to my presentation here. Where's the slideshow? There we go. Okay, so we're going to talk about how to take off with your course. Now, the question I have for you, and I want you to think about it, is why are you here? Not in my presentation. Why are you here? Why are you here? Well, what is, what is, what is your, your role at Utah State? What is your role? Well, I'm a professor. You're a professor. So what brought you to this point? I know it's a long story. Like you like school. <laughs> I do, actually. I like Who here school. are educators? We're teachers, we're instructors, we're professors, right? So there's a reason that we're here, and our students need to see that. And whenever we start a course, that is the big picture. That is the first question you have to ask, is why are you teaching this course? When I thought about this presentation today, it all came about because I talked to my boss about creating a new online master's program. I want to give our students, after they graduate, an opportunity to get their master's degree. But they're flying in Alaska or Hawaii, or they're working down in southern Utah, a crazy flying schedule doing tours over the Grand Canyon, the big ditch, as it's affectionately known among pilots, right? <laughs> and here they are. They're trying, and they want advanced education, but they can't have a traditional program. So I sat down and worked with City and said, how can we make this more exciting? So my big picture was to create a program where they're able to take the traditional classroom environment online. Who here teaches online courses? Okay. Who here may teach them in the future and wants to teach them? Is it easy to think about transitioning from face to face? Do you feel comfortable in front of the students? It's hard. Yeah. How can you go out there presenting? Imagine yourself presenting to an empty classroom where you don't have the faces <laughs> smiling at you. You don't have the reactions. It makes a big difference, doesn't it? So when you're thinking about a Canvas course in that context, you have to now shift and see, how am I going to be able to present that? So today, I'm going to talk about the art and science of Canvas. Last year, I gave a presentation about the art and science of flight. The science is the content. That's all the objectives. That's everything you're going to present. The art is the presentation. Who here has heard the word edutainment? <laughs> what is that? What's edutainment? 
you got to entertain them. You do. You teach them. Today's millennials, in a great presentation this morning, they like to be entertained, right? They come into class, and if you're up here with a chalkboard, they're not going to be impressed. A dry erase board, okay, maybe, right? They want to see electronics. There was a presentation last hour about creating games. They want to see that. It takes a lot of time and effort to do that. But when you're doing an online course, you have to balance that out. And we're going to talk about that. So what I say is the number one rule is you have to set high expectations for yourself in the class. Make sure you know exactly what you want to teach and how you want to teach it. So who here is creating a new course or they have some question about a course that they're creating? What course well, are you I'm teaching? Creating a new, I'm creating um, a writing fundamentals course. Okay, writing fundamentals. So what is your big picture for your course? What is the overall class called or what is the goal? Uh, well, the overall class is writing fundamentals. So it's just teaching these students to be able to ride a horse and safely, ride a horse safely. Very good. Okay, so riding. So the idea is riding. <laughs> right. Riding a horse, not a metaphor for life. Actually, how to ride a horse, right? Yeah. How to ride a horse. So who here knows how to ride horseback? Okay. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good question. So now, is this going to be it's going to be a face-to-face -face class and go out to the lab, right? Yes. So just like flying an airplane, this is not theory. Right. This is actual practice. Now, do the students come in motivated in this class? Do they come in motivated? Motivated. It's not a core class, right? They don't have to take it. It's an elective. It's something they want to take. Uh, I think this one is required. It's required. It, but it's an equine science degree, and so it's not that writing is like crucial. I mean, I feel like it's a crucial part, but it's not oh, all thank of you. it, right? It's one component of their whole degree. Now, I'm not going to draw a horse up there. I can draw airplanes, but <laughs> I cannot draw animals. So the idea is, so you want to, so the expectation is that they learn how to ride a horse. Yes. How many of them have ridden a horse before? Well, that's kind of why I'm creating the new ah. How many of you have grown up riding horses? You know, there's a few out there. Even in the College of Agriculture, you know, we have, we have yeah. some people ride horses. But so there's, you, you come together and you think, okay, I need to be able to get them, what skill level? So you got to yeah. think about what are, some, what are some of the challenges you have? Fear? Uh, yeah, there is a fear. There's okay. A balance, there's a fitness component of it. Um, and then the actual talent or ability to be able to communicate with the horse, which can be difficult for certain personalities. So all this is part of the pre-flight. They gotta learn all this, right? Yeah, right? They gotta learn the parts of the horse, where you stand, how to get in the saddle. Put yeah. yeah it, it, my my brother and I decided to go horseback riding with a with a scout group one time, and they said, "Okay, here's the horses." And I still remember this to this day. He goes, "Okay, here's a horse named Trouble. That's his name." <laughs> no hands went up, right? Yeah. I'm going. My brother goes, "All right, him." You know, he was on the horse maybe. 20, 30 seconds before he went flying over the head. I'm kind of going, why do you have a horse named Trouble for us youth, you know? <laughs> so, okay. So, in other words, there, there's a lot of things you have to think about. Um, and this is what we're going to talk about a little bit today. I'm going to get on this, the faculty-student interaction. When you're in a classroom, it's easy, right? I can look you in the eye. I can see who's taking notes in the back and who's head down with a blue glow in their face, right? we all seen that, right? Uh, it's not, it's not, they're, they're looking at something, right? And they go, how'd you know it was on my phone? Yeah, it's pretty easy. Um, but yet, student-to-student -student interaction is also good. You guys do, have you heard of Think, Pair, Share? Yeah. Who has not heard of Think, Pair, Share? Okay, Think, Pair, Share is a great way. You have a large room, and let's say you've got 78 students in my aviation professions class. I can't interact with everybody. So I'll present a question out there, and I'll say, I want you to think about why are you deciding aviation as a career? Why are you motivated? <coughs> And then when you're thinking about it, I'll say pair up with the neighbor. So, you know, two, three people together, and you talk for a minute or two, and then I'm going to call on a couple of people to share. Do you see how that works in the big classroom? I, if I took the time for every one of you to share why you're here today, I'd be done. We don't have enough time. But yet if I have you talk to each other for a minute, now everybody is participating, and then you can do that sharing, and someone gets to speak in the class. Now, how would that work in, on an online environment? Can you still do something like that online? How do you do that? Conversation, but it's not going to be instantaneous since, like, an yeah. online total course, they don't 
you can't force them to interact at a specific time. And that's very time. asynchronous. So yeah. I, I have to do the in-synchronous discussions. And I've done that as well to some great success. Well, I'll, I'll present a, a thought-provoking question so they have to answer it. Yeah. And I, I tell them the most interesting question, answer that I like, will get some bonus points. And so they actually challenge each other. And one of them from my aviation law class, I said, come up with a scenario. And I gave them the website to the National Transportation Safety Board. I said, pick a, pick a scenario that relates either to your profession as a pilot or maintenance and, and, and see which one out there presented a case where it was obvious to someone, that, to you, that they broke the law, they did something wrong, but they tried to get away with it, and they got caught. And it was interesting when they would pull it up, because someone said, oh, I thought of that one too, I should have posted first, because then they got to pick another one. You know, but it gets them excited and interacting in a way, and for the most part, all but two students did very well with our online discussions. A couple of them, just like your one student, no offense, in the back corner, you know. <laughs> He's paying attention, but there's always a student that wants to hide. Guess what, on online courses, you'll have those students as well. And, and that's becomes more of a challenge. Um, but, uh, but promote active learning. What is active learning? Who wants to tell me what active learning is? What is active learning? And nobody wants to take a, a stab at it, huh? Yes? So you're, you're applying that knowledge. We take that knowledge and we apply it in a, in a real setting. Okay. So is a lecture active learning? No. no. Let's go back to our example about learning to ride a horse. Where does the active learning take place? On the horse. That's right. <laughs> yeah. No, no. yeah. In other words, it's not just theoretical in the classroom. The active learning takes place when it says, did you pay attention to how to get on a horse? Do not walk near the back end of a horse. Okay. Who's been kicked by a horse besides me? <laughs> I, I was walking around. I got a little too close. He said, no, if you walked around really close, they didn't tell me that. You either have to be this close or this far away. If you're right here, that's the danger zone, right? I learned the hard way. Um, no broken ribs. That's pretty good. But so active learning. Active learning is a way to engage. In online learning, that becomes a little more challenging, doesn't it? When you're in an online learning environment, how do you incorporate activities They'll do that. We'll talk about it a little bit. And then the most important thing we're going to talk about at the end is feedback. So if I don't get it, uh, make sure I say feedback at the end. But uh, that is, I saw when I did an online class uh, with presentations where I was a student. And I'll show you this slide. It worked out very well because we were getting peer feedback as a group. So every one of us presented a topic, and then we got feedback from all the classmates that week instantaneously. And it relieved the burden on the instructor. And you can do that with upper division courses. And so for an online master's program, I think it's going to work out pretty well. When you're doing some you know, basic courses, you may not feel that your students can provide that feedback, and you may have to provide it. But what do you do if you have 200 learners online? That's a lot of work. So I like the idea of using some peer feedback, being able to give them instant results, uh, being able to give some feedback more than just pass-fail on, on some classes. So this right here is a real slide put on by the Pentagon. Uh, this is a, yes. Okay, remember, this is the art. We just talked about some of the science. This is a real slide. Um, Air University, Defense Air University put this together, and the general of the Pentagon said, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> so I was censoring it for the video in the audience at home. But uh, I just couldn't believe that someone actually thought that this would be an acceptable slide. To, to present to a senior leader. So again, presentation is everything. So when you talk about it, you've got to build this map. Now, to use the aviation analogy, a map is what? What does a map tell you? Frank, you're a pilot. What does a map tell you? Help you know where to go. That's right. It tells you where am I now and where do I want to go. Okay. So for a class, I'm taking a bunch of students that don't know how to ride or maybe a little bit different levels, and I want to bring them to this level. And that's the analysis. So the ones who don't know how to ride can learn how to ride. The ones who can ride a little bit should be better. So we want everybody to improve. And what I've seen, and I saw in several presentations today, reinforces the idea, if you have a 15-week course, should you have 15 modules? That's the easy way to do it, but a lot of times that's too much. Bring it down to about five modules. They can span a couple weeks. It's a lot easier for someone to, to, to comprehend that. It makes it much more manageable, not so overwhelming. 
So look at trying to develop about a five to seven modules for your course, especially online. When you're doing week to week and you'll be there with them every day, you can guide them through. But when they're sitting by themselves at a desk with a computer screen, it can seem kind of overwhelming. So my recommendation is break it up to about five to seven modules and have them identified. Do you have to use the chapters in order in the book? <laughs> of course not. You have to use every one. No, in our acts investigation class, the book has 45 chapters. And what we're going to do is we're going to give the core, and then they get to select. They love choice, right? So they're going to take the first seven chapters, which is the basic, and now they get to pick hydraulics, electrical, structural, power plants. They're going to pick three of those five areas that will cover the last 20-some-odd chapters of the book. And they get to pick three of those five to become pretty smart at, and then they're going to do a presentation, upload it online. And that way they can, they can develop an area of their interest without overwhelming them. And I think that's one of the ways to focus. So when, now this is not going to be a, a lesson on objectives today. That's a whole other presentation. But just as a reminder, when you're developing your online class or anything, there's a couple different formats out there. You can see them online. Whether you use this, this method is, is fine. But you have an idea of, of who's your audience. Is it people who have never written? You, if this was an advanced writing course, it would be much differently organized. Okay? And if you have learners that are highly motivated in upper division, you can expect a lot more. One of my classes, I won't tell you who it was last year, we averaged 120 pages of reading a week. Now, what do you think about this? Is, is, is that a fair amount of reading? For undergrad? Grad? <laughs> it's, it's up for discussion, right? But 120 pages, would you say for the average student, is that? For one class. Are, are they going to read all of it, you think? They won't. So why do you assign 120 pages when you think they're not even going to read it? <laughs> a week. <laughs> so, so what's another way to do that then? To give them that, if the, that's not a realistic objective. So how would you say, I want you to read these pages and then skim the rest. Okay, and we'll talk about it, but really these are the ones. Focus on what's important. And you know, look at the text, look at what's important. I saw that with one of my classes. I went through and I said, you know what, I like all the chapters, but chapters 11 and 12 don't really apply. So I told them, you know what, those are extra credit. If you want to read those and answer the questions, I'll give you extra credit, but they're not required. Most of my students read those chapters and did the extra credit. So they did it on their own, but I didn't have to assign them 120 pages. Yes, sir? Did they read the other chapters? Those ones you gave them extra credit for. Well, <laughs> which are the ones that you didn't like. So can you use reverse psychology? Don't have to use it well, <laughs> because I gave them, you know, this old carrot, and unfortunately, it, it works in aviation. They want the grade, they want the points. So on the the homework assignments for those, they they did. And when I did a feedback at the end, most of them said that you know it seemed like a lot more reading because I didn't have class, but I realized it took less time. For some of them, they actually were able to read at their own pace and then reread. But yes. Most of them, all but two students, did all the readings because they turned in the homework questions. And I could tell based upon the essays and the words they wrote, um, you know you can put turn it in automatically on your Canvas page and, and that checks it to see if there's any plagiarism and what percentage overlapping and none of them I could tell they didn't copy and paste from each other. Some are actually, over the summer is nice, one's in Alaska, one's in England, they're, they're from all over the world taking the class. So. Um, let's, let's move on here for a second as we talk about the second part that I think is, you know, this is the, the building part. When you're building your big plan, this is something that people think about at the end. When should you think about assessment? When you're looking at the map, right? How do you evaluate? So when I'm planning my trip over here where I'm going to go, I need to think is how am I going to evaluate that? If it's something that you can't measure, then, then you've got to look at, at how you're teaching, how's the objectives. So for us, I love aviation. Everything is relevant. When, I, when I'm teaching about aviation law or the fundamentals of flight or weather, next week when you're in the airplane, guess what? You're going to experience everything we're teaching today. This is something you're going to see very soon. So that's what's exciting about, about me. So look at, look at your classes and look how it fits in the program. Try to figure out how is this relevant and that will help their motivation. So when we look at assessments, again, I'm not going to talk about how to do these, but who, who's done quizzes on Canvas? Okay? Um, and it grades it automatically for you, doesn't it? Pretty, unless it's an essay, then you have to go back and grade it. But yeah, essays. The, the, why is an essay better than, a, than just a multiple choice, do you think? Makes them think more. Yeah, I like that. It helps out, right? It gives a student an opportunity to tell you what they know. Um, they may not have the precise word on a multiple choice, but an essay lets them show what they do know. But what about grading? No, it's more work. It's more work, right? <laughs> and it's very subjective. 
And so um, I had a great teacher this summer show a rubric where she went through it on Canvas, posted it, and, and just marks if you had this many examples, if, if you point out these things, and it was just click, 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 click. And so by the time you got your grade, it was, there was nothing left to argue. It made it very simple, and I go, I like that. I'm going to use it in my classes um, because I'm able to see exactly how to do that. But essays take more time. And for upper division classes or, or graduate level, I think they need to have more essay and less multiple choice. You're not trying to have them memorize parts of a horse, right? You, I mean, that's, that's important, but now you're trying to have them apply that in a way. You know, write an essay of how would you direct the horse to turn left as you're going down the trail. How do you stop the horse when it starts to jog and trot and gallop? And what's the difference between each of those, right? Um, peer review is something that, that I didn't do in my other class until this last time. Um, who, who's done peer review for a class? What have you done? Um, I make them uh, read each other's essays together. And uh, I, actually, I do two forms of peer review. I make them sit in a group and read aloud an essay and give instant feedback. And I also make them uh, read it silently in class, mark it up, and hand it in, and, and eventually. Get I love it. Through. Can you do that online as well? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. This is one I really like, and I wish I would have used it last year, but I like it. So you take an essay and you say, you guys are in, in a pair, so you're going to read his and she'll read yours, and that's how you're going to do this essay. And the next time I'll pair you up with somebody else. Yeah. 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 And so it's a signed pairing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and why is a signed pairing? Because if you use random pairing, then you guys all change and no one wants to read your paper. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know? But with the signed pairing, it, it kind of breaks it up. And you can do it online. And that works well with, with any number of students you have. If you have an odd number, then the three of you, you know, just rotate papers. That's a good way to do it. And I like the peer review because it, it helps them understand what it's like to, to be reading. Because a lot of times you think, oh, I wrote this paper. It's great. And you don't realize that what's missing in there because it, you're thinking about it as you write it and you read it. But when you read her paper, all of a sudden it's like, wow, I can see where she explained this much better than I did. So while they're evaluating someone else's paper, what are they also doing? They're evaluating their own paper. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and when you're in a classroom and you do presentations, that's another peer review, right? Can you do a peer review on presentations with an online course? Absolutely. There's ways for them. You can have them upload a PowerPoint presentation. These kids, they can do a lot with these little magical devices. When I was getting my master's in 97, I wrote a paper on this new technology, active matrix liquid crystal flat panel displays. We all have them in our pockets now. <laughs> you know? But uh, yeah, if you ask them, in fact, one of the uh, demonstrations in the city they gave uh, last year at a presentation was for an intro video, the, uh, the professor didn't just sit in front of his computer. He took a GoPro camera, and he went hiking up here in the, in the mountains. And I said, he goes, hey, I just want to let you know who I am, and I love to go out hiking and fishing, and here's my favorite spot. But I'm not going to tell you how to get here because I don't want you to come up here, you know? <laughs> so it was entertaining. It was his personality, but he did this video. And I thought, I bet you if you challenge your students to do that, say, hey, come up with a 90-second to two-minute video and post it online. Do you think they could do that? Absolutely. And what does that do? It shows how you can use technology to make it fun. It's the same information. As, as, as typing it in, but it's a little bit different because it shows the personality, what they do. So I talked, since I, I'm a professor of aviation here on campus, I teach the academic courses, and then they go down the flight line, the airfield, and fly with the young students. So I got to go talk to them into let me take an airplane and to go do a video in the air. So I haven't done that yet, but I wanted to. All right, so as we talk about building a map, this is where it starts. You've got to build that map. And so let's talk about this. This is an example of a class I did this summer. And I thought, rather than just having text, how awesome is this? It says, here, here's the date of the things. This is what's due. And it's kind of in a fun little format. It makes it pretty neat. You know, it kind of shows. And this is what he has. This is all missing. And he cleaned up Canvas. And, and look at the presentation. This is, this is interesting. Kind of tells you what it is. And, oh, I guess you can see I got 24 out of 25 on a video file. But, um, you know, it's all right there on, on the front page. It's a little bit of effort. And, and if you want some ideas on this, go talk to the folks at City. They can help you do this to your Canvas courses to make them a lot more fun. So interaction. I want to talk about interaction. This is probably one of the most challenging things for students with online programs and courses. And when they've, I've done uh, some other um, seminars where we've talked about that when students look at, at academia, one of the most important aspects for them is the relationship they have with the, the teacher. And how do you do that? Can, they, they, they live in Blanding <laughs> or 
Or I have one student in Pakistan who wants to take our master's program. How do you do office hours, right? You don't have that personal interaction. So what are some, what are some ways to get the faculty-student interaction to mirror some of those that you have in a traditional campus here? What are some things you can do? Yes? Use a back channel so that when someone's presenting, the other students are commenting or asking questions because they, they're reluctant to interrupt from regional sites and whatever while someone's yeah. speaking. Yeah, so if you have a class where you do it online, there's a way to do that. I did a webinar in May where people were posting questions as I'm talking. And at first I'm going, going wait a minute, what's people typing over here? You know? <laughs> then I realized, oh, that's a good question. And I was able to incorporate that into my presentation. It may not be easy to do for everyone, but be able to. So yeah, it, what if it's not online at the same time, though? What if it's someone at a different time zone? Mm -hmm. What are some ways to get feedback? Well, I use a lot of the commentary that goes along with assignments and uh, the discussion panel to the side. You can also record audio. I don't know if, can you record video in that pan, pan? I'm not sure. But that creates a dialogue with, and somebody's You can. Yeah. Travis so says yes. I've done audio, <laughs> so it's, I can explain something. And oh, yeah. that keeps a log of that, that discussion back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I, when I look at this, um, one, of my, one of my teachers, it was an online class this summer, one week he said, we're not going to have class this week. The assignment is you have to send an appointment with me, and we're going to get online, whether um, you know, FaceTime or, or, or audio or some other system, and we're going to have a chat. And we're going to talk about the course so far and your homework. And I thought, well, for a small class, that's pretty good. You know, for about a dozen or so people, you know, 15 minutes a person, that's three hours of your time that week. But it was face-to-face. -face. You're interacting with the student. You're, they have a chance to ask questions, and it was required. That was your class that week. No other homework, no other readings, but you set up a time to talk with the instructor. And, of course, almost everybody did it at evening because they're working over the summer, like I was as well. So there's ways to have that, that interaction. But that personal touch is key. If you just sit there and set up a Canvas course with auto-grade quizzes and they turn in their homework and at the end of the semester they get a grade, what are they going to think about that? You know, you see what I'm saying? You've got to have that interaction. And I think that's something that, that has to be focused on so don't lose that personal touch. Or to quote the individual who was here this morning in this room, he goes, if a student can Google it, why are we teaching it? So that brings up, the, if that's the case, then why do you need a personal touch? I mean, you're saying that you can't, you don't want to lose the personal touch because the students will lose interest, but if they're changing so much in how they bring in information, then maybe we don't need the personal touch. You just need to provide them in a information in a way that they can access it well and take it in. I think there's a lot of learners that are self-motivated um, who are able to pick up a book and learn on their own and maybe even do experiments. I think there are some out there. But I think in learning and education, there's more than just the textbook learning. That's the science of it. There's the art. There's the passion, the motivation. Yeah, I guess that's not really my question. My question more is though that if, if I guess two things. One, the way students are learning is changing, and also in a sense, you know, in some fields, it's not a matter of whether you have a degree. It's what you can do that's yeah. important. Well, you're right. This, that's a whole other so, seminar. So if that is yeah. changing, then are we just trying to make online courses mirror our in-person courses because we think we're important as the instructor? <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> However, it depends. It really depends. Like horseback riding, can you read a book and then go out there and hop on a horse and ride it? No, I don't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm going to talk to you about how to fly an airplane. I'll give you the keys, and you can go down and fly an airplane. Would you feel comfortable? Awesome. No. You know what I mean? So I, I think there are some courses that you could probably say, yeah. There are some courses, entry-level introductory courses, that you could probably say, this is an online course. You read the textbook. Right now, the question is, and, and not to get off the topic too much, but the question came in our department, university-wide, is what about challenge courses? Could someone come in there who's owned a small business for the last five years, come into the Huntsman School of Business, and take a challenge test about entrepreneurship? You know, that's the question. If they've demonstrated that they've mastered those concepts, and they've proven it by having a small business. They have a landscape business the last five years. That's how they got through college. Should you give them credit for that real world learning if they can, can meet a test understanding that? So that's a good question. And I don't know that we'll answer it in the remaining three minutes I have. But I tell you what, that is good. Um, 
Time on task. This is something that you can see on Canvas. I love to go at the end of the week and look to see how much time people spent on events. You can see whether they spent 20 minutes on the quiz or an hour and 20 minutes. You can see if they were watching a video. Did they just watch the first five minutes? Because it shows how long they were on Canvas. It doesn't tell me that they didn't just click it on and then go over here and play a game. I don't know. But at least I know some of that, a little bit of time on task. So you have to have something. This is an example of what I did in the Air Force. I flew uh, combat rescue C-130s, refueled helicopters, and obviously this is multitasking because you're carrying a payload, refueling a helicopter, and flying around. Um, but feedback is key. If I can emphasize one thing, is you've got to provide feedback. Whether you tell the students, I'm going to respond within 48 hours or provide weekly feedback, if there's a discussion board post, guess what? Go ahead and chime in. Let them know that you're reading the post. You know, say, hey, this is the best post of the day. Something as simple as that. They don't even need extra credit points. Sometimes the public recognition is all that they need. But find some opportunities to give that feedback. This is an example of the one class I was telling you. So every week, they had different students were assigned. They created a lesson. Again, this is upper level. This is a, for a PhD class. They created the assignments. We went in there, read their lesson, did the assignment. They evaluated us. We evaluated them. Lots of peer-to-peer -peer evaluation. And so this was probably 90% student-learner interaction. I thought it was very, very effective. For those that put a lot of time in their lessons, I got a lot out of it. And for some, that will remain nameless, who didn't have a handout or didn't quite put as much effort into it, we saw very quickly, remember that peer evaluation, I was thinking about my own as well. Uh, the last thing about flight plans uh, as we run up. So you create your models, you write your objectives, you build your shell. And if we had a little more time, but I'm running out of time, is we would actually talk about the big things. So riding a horse, what would be some of the, just tell me three big steps that you'd want to do. Uh, this is the scaffolding, right? Uh, Oh, very good. I like that. See, they start on their own. You just got to hop on the horse. It starts on its own, right? <laughs> Steering and stopping. Those are the most important things. But, but then you break those down, right? You don't have to go into a lot of detail. As I tell folks, if, if you're going to be able to fly an airplane, you don't have to design it and build it. You're not teaching them how to, how to groom a horse, maybe. You're just learning how to ride the horse, right? They don't have to shoe it first. Um, but this is the part right here, the add the content. This is where you start to add all the art. Look at ways to add videos. You've got to challenge it. In the classroom, you do PowerPoints, you have videos, you have interactions. You do a lot of things. You've got to incorporate that on the online content to keep them engaged. Vary it. Don't do the same thing week to week. Add some videos, add some discussion boards, have them upload something, have them go to an online site. There's a lot of ways to add variety up there. And if you challenge them on a week by week basis, you'll be surprised how it keeps them entertained and engaged. Okay? Uh, make sure you have links on there. And then, of course, your assessments, which you're going to do. Um, and if we had some time left over, which we don't, I'd ask for a volunteer. Um, obviously, he looks like a happy volunteer, right? Um, but but uh, the idea is, is to look at ways to improve your course. And if, if I left you with anything today, the idea of Canvas is not to just take away the student interaction, to make it easy for you. No. Canvas is a tool to be able to help you bring your personality into it. I want to close with an example of what we're trying to do here. And uh, uh, so I want to talk about this course here. So we're doing aviation. And it's not scrolling down. OK. So these are our Aggie wings. And as they complete the modules, the wings will start to fill in. And when they complete the course, the wings will be completely filled in. I'm going to patent that, okay? Can city help us figure out how to do Yes, yes. This is them. My idea, their talent. Okay? So I said, we're going to talk about taking off on a runway, right? So when you look in a cockpit, this is what they're going to see on, on the main page. So every, every class will be here. So pre-flight checklist. That's, that's, that's where they, they get their, their, uh, their uh, preparations. Flight plan. What would the flight plan be, do you think? The, the syllabi. The syllabus. Waypoints would be all the modules, the approach. Okay, that's at the end of the course. Check six. Now, who knows what that is? 12 o'clock is ahead, three, and where's check six? So, what would check six be then? Reflection. Grades, reflection. Yeah, it's your grades. 
And of course, destination, will that's the, the ultimate objectives. And if they click on here, they get my bio. And they have to click on this, remove before flight. When they get there, that's all their, the, the stuff you want them to read. The syllabus quiz, the uh, administrative policies, so that they can't say, well, I didn't know I had to do that. Because I know you did when you clicked this. So that's kind of my idea of how to take a fun, boring aviation law course <laughs> and make it exciting by related to aviation. This is a cockpit instrument. Uh, whenever you look in the size of the aircraft, modern technology, that's what they use to fly. Um, I know we ran out of time, and my, I got like 30 seconds for a question or two, if anybody has one. Uh, we kind of did some before as well. Thank you. Appreciate your video and watching. If you have any questions, Andreas Wiesman at usu.edu. Come see us at the Aviation Technology. Have a good day.